Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome to the Low Carb MD podcast. Guys, Brian's missing a really good one. It's me. This is Tro Kalasian. And I am here with two actually amazing people and live with all of our Patreon supporters and uh, people in our practice. So uh, very thankful to have all our Patreon supporters and really appreciate you guys helping keeping this program commercial free. Um, so we have actually an amazing story. This is somebody I've followed, uh, and today we're going to meet her uh, and the better half and hear maybe a little bit about mom as well. But this is somebody I've followed for a number of years who just made an amazing transformation. And the, co the context of her posts, I just relate to on, you know, uh, such a deep level that I was like, you know what, we got to get her on. We got to get him on. They've both been through a journey together uh, and, and even infected mom. They have two young kids. This is Laura and Chris Spath. And uh, if you're not following her on Instagram, I highly recommend you go follow her. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's actually just an amazing, amazing journey. So what really prompted me to, to reach out to you guys was, you know, I saw this picture of a young couple, uh, both overweight, both, uh, you know, seemingly looking like metabolically unwell. And then just this like radiance, you know, like several years later, it's almost as if you guys look like, you know, you were the kids of your former selves. So, you know, when I saw that picture, I was like, why haven't we had them on the podcast? You know, I'm, I think, Laura, I've been following you for like two years on, I just love your content on Instagram. And I just couldn't believe that we didn't reach out to you sooner. So I said, you know what, let's just get them on. Let's hear the story behind what happened. You guys have lost, I think, a total of 250 pounds together. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so 250 pounds. Um, it's just an amazing, amazing story. And I wanted to hear, uh, I know a little bit about it from social media. And I know you've affected mom. And I know you guys have two beautiful kids. And, you know, they're probably rooting mom and dad on too. But I, I wanted to get a sense of the story. So first of all, welcome. And uh, second of all, um, you know, what was it like? What was it like back then, you know, before you kind of found your way? Um, so yeah, tell me about that, you know, kind of what, who were the, who was that couple from the before picture I saw? We have been married um, for about eight years and we, you know, we both um, were overweight for a really long time. I started gaining weight in college um, and when, it, when you move away from home and you have to start buying food for yourself, you buy fast food and I, kind of had junk food for the first time in my life when I went to college and gained the freshman probably 30 and kind of really then spent, you know, the next 15 years just really gaining and losing uh, weight um, and, you know, kind of up and down. We, when Chris and I met, I was in my, you know, mid twenties uh, and was pretty overweight. Um, and we then kind of yo-yo dieted together, but I had always been somebody who could easily get, lose 20 pounds and then I would reward myself with a cheat day and then gain it all back, never be able to get back on track again, gain another 20. Then I would get serious, lose 20 pounds pretty quick because, because you know, you get serious, you can lose that first when you're overweight. And then I would celebrate because I deserved a cheat day and then gain it all back again. And so I spent 10 years cycling through that. I tried at one point a vegan diet because I thought, you know, you watch the documentary that was out, whatever the new vegan documentary that was out at the time, 10 years ago or so. And I thought this is how I'm going to be healthy. And so I did a vegan diet for a little bit um, and lost weight as a lot of people do. But then I also, my hair started falling out um, and really just same thing. My mom and I were always people who gained and lost weight together. So she and I did this vegan thing for a while together. Uh, as somebody who's older, she started having, she, her arthritis got a lot worse doing that. It just really wasn't working for either one of us. Um, we did a lot of, oh, we did the juice diets and the hack diets and whatever was out there. We did Adkins for a while uh, and just 
kind of settled. Chris and I met and we were both overweight. I'll let him tell you his backstory. Um, and then maybe we can go through kind of once we got married. Yeah. yeah so just, I, I, I just want to get a quick sense, Chris. So, yeah. so, okay. Um, here you are. Okay. You struggled all throughout your twenties, Laura. Now, Chris, did you also have that similar struggle all throughout your kind of childhood tendency to gain weight or, you know, were you cut I, from the same cloth? Yeah. When I was even in high school, I was overweight. Um, and after high school, I wound up joining the air force and to join the air force, I had to lose 60 pounds before I could make weight. Wow. So I ran every day and ate chicken and rice and lost that weight and then spent four years in the air force struggling to stay under their requirement on weight. So once I got out of the military, um, it was a steady climb from the 210 pounds I was when I got out to the 300 pounds I was when we started to get ourselves straight. You know, it was, uh, I've always been, uh, my vice has always been sugar and, you know, bad food. So I celebrate with it. If I'm sad, I eat it, it anything. It's like, it's my drug, you know? And, uh, when we met, we were both kind of in that same situation and that kind of fed off each other that way, honestly, you know, and, and, uh, then we did do some things together where we tried and, and nothing was really sustainable. And, um, we, I mean, like two, we just, I mean, we, I remember us too, like, especially early dating and we would cook a lot together. Chris made me this like fabulous homemade three tiered birthday cake one year. I mean, it's just like, that was how our relationship started was just creating this relationship around food and where we were eating out and kind of everything revolved around that uh, a lot. That's, in the that's like, that's like most of our relationships, right? Yeah. I mean, the modern world is like, what are you going to do? You're going to go out to eat, you know, yeah. you're going to go out to a movie, get popcorn, Skittles, and then you know, go out to dinner afterwards. So a lot of what we do is uh, revolves around food. Now, um, so so, did you guys meet after the Air Force? So Chris, you were in the Air Force. You kept your weight down. A lot of central planning, a lot of discipline, and then uh, so what happens? So Chris what happens is a little older than me, so he sure. lived life a little longer than I did before. Got we it. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So what? So. What, what does your weight look like when you guys meet? You know, now you finally, you're struggling with weight, both of you guys, and then finally kind of meet. And I'm just curious, like what, you know, what's, what's your weight like then? I spent most of my kind of twenties, I think, in, in, um, in around like 220 pounds. I think I probably fluctuated around like 230 to 210 most of the time that, um, uh, and I would like decide I was going to lose weight and maybe get to 199 and then I would gain a whole bunch back again. So that I spent most of my life around there until we had kids and then I gained more. But And I was around 270 when we met. Yeah. Okay. So you were like 100. So, so you had already kind of gained some of that. And are you a tall guy, Chris? Or, or I'm six foot. Yeah, six foot. Okay. So you were probably very lean. And what weight did you have to keep in, in the military? Um, I think I had to be under 210. Yeah, so you had to be under 210. So, you know, by that time you had get, you had kind of walked yourself up maybe five pounds a year, or 10 pounds a year. You probably battled back and forth at 270. Okay, and then now you guys meet. Okay, and you guys start going out and you're going to restaurants. And what does that look like before you guys get married? And then what happens to your weight as you guys kind of, you know, uh, as your family grows? I mean, we, uh, we got pregnant right away. And so we, I mean, that was the fun part though, was we got married, we got pregnant and just all of that celebration and that almost like that dating life of going out and eating food like that just continued. And all of a sudden that went straight from the fun, new, like you're in a new relationship and you gain weight like everybody does because you're going out all the time to, I got pregnant and we gained the pregnancy weight right on top of that. And wow. so those things were just like super compounded back to back. And so I gained, you know, when I gave birth to our daughter, um, I was 260 pounds when I went into labor with her. Um, and I think we had even like for the, you know, like but right before that I had tried to lose weight. And so I probably had started around 200 at that time and then gained at least 60 pounds during my pregnancy. And did they, did they tell you, did your OBGYN say to you like, Hey, you should eat less, move more. Or what did nothing. they say to you? you not, not a word. Not, nobody said anything, which was ridiculous. Nothing. Got it. Okay. And uh, they're checking your lab work. They're probably looking for, 
you know, gestational diabetes and, and yeah. uh, did they, did, you know, I'm just curious, did they find anything like that along the, along your, along the way there? You know what, as a, as a miracle, I, they didn't, uh, I think in the very beginning of my pregnancy, I thought like, oh, I'm pregnant. Like this is my first, I started, I was remember drinking tons of spinach smoothies in the morning and I would start off like drinking this big thing of like tons of frozen fruit and yogurt and spinach and thinking that was like me being good and pregnant and healthy. And then by the end of the day, I would eat a pan of Rice Krispie treats because I just couldn't maintain that all day. Yeah. You're starving and you're pregnant and you're like emotional and you just can't sustain that type of healthy eating, you know, if, I mean, I'm using air quotes, if you're just audio listening to this, because, um, it just wasn't sustainable and I would end up eating a pint of ice cream at night. Okay. And, and, uh, when my wife was pregnant, I gained the sympathy weight. I don't know, Chris, did that happen? You know, it's like funny. I saw my wife having cravings and, and my wife doesn't have the same appetite as me, but you know, she was having some candies at the time. And, let me tell you, I was rating that candy drawer all the time. Yeah. So Chris, I'm just curious along that the same time, what's, what's happening with you? What's happening with your appetite? What's happening with your weight? Of course. Um, I mean, your I'm, health. I'm at that time, I think the expression fat and happy is kind of, you know, we were kind of miserable in a lot of ways, but we were on the ride, you know, uh, being a new couple, getting ready to have a baby and all that. And we just yeah. ate and ate and ate and didn't really have any sense of the repercussions of that. And it wasn't until later that, you know, got slammed. Well, in face. the middle of my pregnancy, um, like almost like two thirds of the way through my pregnancy, Chris found out he was type two diabetic. Uh, and so that was kind of a wake up call for, for both of us in that moment. And he, he had, kind of stopped at that point trying to be with me. And like, that was even harder for him to get on track because I still was in this, you know, six to nine months pregnant mode. And he was just found out he was diabetic and didn't really know what to do about it. That must have come as a huge shock. I mean, a guy who was athletic, military guy, you know, ran, kept his weight down. And then, you know, you found yourself with, with type two diabetes. That, that must have been a huge shock to you. It was a big wake up call. Um, they, you know, I, I, I started ha obviously having the symptoms. I was peeing a lot and different things like that, you know, and went to the doctor and, and they put me on metformin and didn't give me really any other advice than that. They just put me on metformin. And said, How long was that visit that you went to? Uh, you know, when you went to the doctor, they did the blood work. They said, you're diabetic. You go on metformin. How long was that visit? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So you have diabetes. Here's a medication. 10 minutes of time. Yep. You're yeah. going to have this forever. Keep taking this. Eventually you'll have to take shots. That was the whole thing. Wow. Wow. And uh, so they you did tell me to lose there. weight. They told me to lose weight. That'll help. They didn't say how or anything. They just said lose some weight. Right. That'll help. Just, just go eat less. Yeah. Right. Just go eat less. So that, I mean, how did you take that news? I mean, you know, uh, how, how, what was your age when you were diagnosed, you know, with the type two? Uh, 41. Okay. So you're, 41. so you're 41 years old, very young. You're diagnosed with type two. That must've been like, I mean, what, what, were, when you walked out of there, what were you thinking? At the time, because he didn't really get into any of the information, I really didn't have understand the gravity of it. Uh, I just thought, okay, I take this medication, you know, I try to eat a little better and I'll be fine. It wasn't until um, a couple years later when I actually got, uh, and I didn't do any research at the time on my own. I just kind of took his word, started moving forward. I actually did lose a little weight after that. You know, I started exercising more and eating a little better and probably got down to around 230, 240. But then so you, uh, you lost like 30 pounds or so. Did you, was your, were you out of the diabetic range at that point or no? After losing no, Well, when I was on the metformin and I was eating better, my yeah. blood sugars were better and under right. control relatively. Yeah. Um, you know, they weren't as bad. So I'm like, oh, I'm fine. I can do whatever I want. And yeah. so I would still eat bad a couple times a week. And I would, st I, I really didn't take it too seriously. So you were kind of flirting with uh, disaster basically. Yeah. Got it. Using the okay. medication as an excuse to say like, well, now I can eat what I want because I have a medication that's helping me to regulate those things. So I don't have to 
take it as seriously or, or not even understanding that you had to take it seriously. You just thought the medication fixed it. So you could go back to eating those things. Yeah. And what, and what, so what do you think? So now you're in, you're finished with your first pregnancy. Did the baby weight come off? You know, because of that, I guess in some ways too, like he was type two diabetic. My mom was type two diabetic. My grandma was type two diabetic. I was like, okay, what's the big deal? Take the medicine. We'll just, what are you, what are you gonna do about it? Like, that's just what happens when you get older. It's like, you're older than me. <laughs> that's what happens. And so I didn't really take it that seriously either. We did after, um, we had our daughter about four months later, you know, I was still nursing, but we both kind of got serious. We did a low carb. We knew like low carb was the thing and there wasn't really keto back then even so we kind of cut the carbs and I would say probably not really low knowing now what we know I mean it was we were probably 50 to 70 a day but we cut out the ice cream and that was a huge part of it you know we were eating a lot of quest bars and um, a lot of processed low carb food at the time a lot of low carb tortillas and stuff like that like dirty low carb Absolutely. Yeah. And okay. we both lost weight. I think I got down to 180 at that time. So um, you went from 270 at, at, after pregnancy down to 180. Yeah. Okay. And then comes another present, right? So we, well, at the time that we got, we both hit our goal weight. I have a picture that I posted that day, like on our, my Facebook or something that said, congratulate, you know, we lost weight. Ta-da. Here we go. Here's our after picture. And we both are standing there, you know, and we literally that day we went out and we got cheesesteaks, French fries and ice cream and we never got back on again. And so our daughter was one year old. We had celebrated her birthday. We celebrated our weight loss. And then we went back to what, exactly what we were doing before. And over the next year, um, I gained 30 pounds. Wow. So, so we found back, out, to, yeah. back to carbs, back to always being hungry, insatiable. Chris, did you gain weight too? Absolutely. So I, at my lowest there, when that she she talks about that picture, I was about two two thirty. I think was my goal, and that's where I had hit. And I thought I was in great shape. I was all excited, but then it was like she said, it was back on the train. And then baby two came, and so we. I found out I was pregnant with my son, and I was um, like probably two hundred and ten pounds. So that was the thirty I had gained, um, and this was maybe you know almost a year later when I gave birth to him again. I was. I, again, I had gained like 50, 60 pounds uh, and was close to that 260, 270 mark again. So kind of all the time I was near 300. Up. So yeah. all the way back. So, so you gained the weight back and now your, your sympathy weight is on and you guys are just eating together and kind of dropping, even though it worked for you, it seems like a little bit of discipline and, and controlling had worked but for both of you guys early on. Yeah. And now low carb seemed to work for you like a dirty low carb, but there was this constant like inclusion of this food and that would just lead you in celebration with this food that made you more hungry. And then when you were hungry again and you know, you, you're kind of off the diet, you just put on weight. Oh you yeah. Know? And it, I mean, it's really because we just, it's such an addicting food and you know, we're not, neither one of us are people who are able to moderate we can't have a cheat night on a Friday night and then get back on track again on Saturday and then just be fine again or be normal people. We can't have a piece of pizza and a corner of a brownie. We're going to eat a half a pizza each or we're each going to order our own pizza. And we're going to split a pan of brownies. Like that was our lifestyle that we lived together before. We're not somebody who could like have us one slice in a salad. Yeah. It never works for us. So actually this is, this is important because uh, a lot of times you know, people come to me and say, well, why shouldn't I just calorie control? Why shouldn't I just portion control? Like if you could do, if you could have done it, you would have done it. Right. Right. Like my wife's not cut from the same cloth as me when she eats, you know, one or two slices of pizza, she's done. She's got this tiny little stomach. She's got an ap no appetite. Right. You know, uh, I mean, I can blow through a pie. No problem. I mean, I'll probably stop when it hurts. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the thing is, I don't have that signal of like fullness. I don't have that. Right. I don't get that. You know, I can eat a, you know, an entire head of broccoli. I can do, I can eat a whole salad and it'll fill my stomach up, but I won't be full. Right. right. So, so I think what I'm sensing here is you guys both had an appetite and the food just kept you eating. You know, the food just kept you eating. And whenever you, you can use your central planning, Chris, it sounds like, 
to like, you know, military background, clearly you have discipline, right? Clearly you can control. And then Laura, you know, you found yourself, um, you know, able to lose 20, 30 pounds if you really think about it. But then you guys went dirty, low carb and kind of lost a lot of weight really effortlessly, but maybe you didn't understand the magic of what was going on and why you guys were losing weight. And then once you went back to the old food and the bad habit, like you were hungry again and, you know, the weight just came back and even more. I think people don't understand that discipline is not the problem. Like we were always very disciplined people. I'm a very, I'm a, I have a, you know, I'm a really focused on my career. I have a very, I work really hard in my real life job. I'm a very driven person. I need to succeed at everything I do. You give me a goal and say, you need to lose 20 pounds and then you can have a cheat day done. Absolutely easy. I'm really good at being determined and having goals. Willpower was not my issue. It's the addiction and it's the never again. It's the forever. It's long-term where I struggle. And even now I still today have to focus on, you know, really short-term things that keep me driven and motivated and like, what's the thing that I'm working towards and what are my goals and, and what's happening? Because I think sometimes people put it on like, I just don't have the motivation or the determination, but but what if you do have determination, you really are sick of your weight, you really are determined to lose it, and you still can't do it. Like, that's a lot of people. And that's definitely the category that we fell in, um, where we could do anything for a short amount of time, but then ask me to sustain it forever or to never go back. Like, that was the part that we didn't understand the food addiction element then, or we didn't understand, um, you know, what forever had to look like for us. Yeah, I, I, it's funny you say that because I think uh, we we have in our practice, so, you know, my practice here, uh, we've had thousands of patients at this point, and I haven't seen one person who's not an expert at weight loss. Yeah. Right? They are all experts at weight loss, right? But uh, if you understand the paradigm that keeps you eating, right, if you understand what it is it that it drives me to eat? What is it my brain's gonna want when I am hungry? What is it that's keeping me eating? What are the things that are gonna make this all fall apart, right? If you get that, then the light bulb goes on and it's like, okay, I know what I need to do to succeed, right? But if you don't understand that, if you don't understand you know, how these food companies manipulate us, if you don't understand how the food is designed to drive us to eat, right? And if you don't understand what it's gonna take, then it's like not knowing your enemy. Right. It's not knowing what you're up against. And then it's not a fair fight. Right. It's not a fair fight if you don't have proper education and you guys have to learn the hard way. I mean, what you know, okay, so I'm just, you know, up to this point, it sounds like just an incredible struggle. This is the story of literally every American. Literally every American, every American couple. When I look at you guys, I'm like, this is every American couple. Mm. Right. When I see your before picture, I'm like, this is the struggle that everybody has and nobody knows what to do right? And they get this brief escape from obesity, right? And then they get ripped right back in, right? They get ripped right back in. And it's like, uh, why am I in jail again? Right? Like, what did I do wrong? I don't understand. Right? And then it's too so, hard. It's too exhausting to do it again. And that's what happened after we had my son. I actually, because I think I was doing too, I was eating restrictive. I was trying to lose weight so much after we had my daughter, it really affected my milk supply. And I struggled with that. I ended up pumping a lot. Like it really struggled and nursing was a really big challenge for me with her. And I, it was just a lot of agony. And so after I had my son, I went like, well, it's obviously because I was trying to diet. It wasn't, it was, I was eating the wrong things, but it was that I was being too restrictive to keep myself healthy at the time. But I thought, well, that was too hard. I can't deal with that emotional stress again of struggling with breastfeeding. I need to focus on that, number one. So I better just not even try to lose weight this time. So we went to you're where- franchise. So yeah, now exactly. you're like, you're basically like, you know what? We've been struggling with this. I can't deal with it. I Your can't. confidence is low. Your ability to, to, so it's, you know, what we call in coaching learned helplessness, right? It's basically, you're like, you know what? I can't do this. I'm not going to do it. It's too hard right now. I'm not going to do it. Right. And, um, and I get it. That's every single person that comes in here is, is in, is in that base or it's the all or none thinking like you're either dieting or you're celebrating, right. Or you're either dieting or you don't give a crap at all. Right. Yeah. There's no, very little middle ground. And these are two traps. I think they're actually part of the addiction cycle. 
I think they're part of the, these two mental uh, traps. Like I, they, what, who wins? What process wins when we have all and run thinking, right? The none thinking, right? That you get ripped right back to, right? The old way you were eating. And what process wins when you have learned helplessness? Like, I can't focus on this. I can't do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. The process that, that you know, the, the, the addiction that's keeping you, that, that wins when you kind of give up. So uh, I think that these two, like, they're very common things that we see in people who struggle to lose weight. It's all, it's all related. And I think it's related to that addiction model. So, so what happened? I mean, when does the light, so it just it sounds like struggle. Chris, it sounds like you're struggling too. When's that light bulb moment where we got to do something different? When does that happen? So after we had our son, it was Christmas. He, so he was like nine months old. Our son was nine months old. Yeah. I was 250 pounds at the time. Chris was easily 300 pounds at the time. Um, <clears throat> I It was Christmas day, actually. Um, never forget that day. But uh, um, Christmas Eve, actually, I had a like a sore on my elbow which was starting to swell and get red and it was like hot to the touch and I wasn't feeling well. And my, my wife convinced me not to go get it checked out because the next morning is Christmas. And you're gonna and ruin I'm Christmas. I'm gonna ruin Christmas. So the next morning- My wife would say the same thing. My wife... Stop being a baby, you're fine. Mm -hmm. He has to ring his always. Like you're gonna ruin Christmas. <laughs> So, <laughs> so Christmas morning we wake up and I can't even function. So I tell her, I'm sorry, you're going to have to do Christmas alone. I'm going to get checked out. So I went to an urgent care and they wound up sending me to a hospital and I was admitted within like 10 minutes of being at the hospital. And I had a necrotizing fasciitis uh, wow. on my arm, which I wound up sp spending about seven weeks in the hospital doing somewhere near 10 different surgeries on my arm. Um, and I survived, but you can see my arm there. From his wrist, yeah, yeah, his wrist wow. to his elbow, they basically, so it so is. If, if nobody knows what necrotizing fasciitis yeah. is, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, it's basically an, an infection, um, a bacterial, usually bacterial infection, a mixed infection of different bacteria that spreads along the fascial planes, like spreads along all the different tissues in the body. And if you have high sugar, diabetes, prediabetes, you're more likely to get this because it's a fertile ground for bacteria to just, just grow. Just like when you have sugar in your mouth, you get cavities. If you have sugar in your blood and your tissues, this bacteria is more likely to spread. And once it starts spreading in those fascial planes, it's very hard to stop. You need a lot of antibiotics, uh, surgery, um, and aggressive uh, blood sugar management. Um, so, so that must have been terrifying. They really I mean, didn't know what it was either. It took them several days. I mean, I think the hospital we were at was definitely not equipped to understand what was happening. They thought it was just like cellulitis. They thought it was a more minor infection. And it probably started off that way, but because his body was so unhealthy, it really just transformed and spread. And I mean... Yeah, and I spent you know, all that time in the hospital and nobody once had a conversation with me, not one doctor about my blood sugar, about type two diabetes. In fact, I ate pizza in the hospital Peanut butter almost, jelly. almost every day from the cafeteria. And then they would just shoot me with insulin. And I have pictures of like um, his stomach, the nurses injecting him in his stomach is just covered in bruises at the time from yeah. all of the insulin shots he was getting every day. I mean, this was got to the point before they figured out what it was. They were telling us to like, you know, it's call family. They somebody needs to come say goodbye to him if there's somebody that needs to say goodbye. And then, obviously, once they realized what it was, um, the once and after the surgeries, then they kept doing all those surgeries. But he was there for, for uh, obviously, you know, a couple months almost. Yeah, and then you know, it wasn't till after I was out of the hospital, even a few months later, because it took a while for me to recover, you know, I was pretty um, PTSD and, you know, pain and dealing with all that for, you know. The pain, I mean, the pain management addiction is a whole other element when you already have this, you know, personality and then they just, you're on a morphine drip or morphine, morphine drip 
for two months and then they cut you off and send you home with the bottles of pills. I mean, that's a whole other thing that he struggled. I'd love to say that he walked out of the hospital. We both had this awakening moment and we got our life together, but it wasn't. It took us almost a year after that to just really recover emotionally. That's that exhaustion. That's that hopelessness that you say is that I can't even think about focusing on this right now. My life is too hard. I don't even know how we made it through like a lot of that year with a newborn and a two-year-old and, and it would, I wish we could have gotten it together sooner, but that picture that you saw was at the end of that, right? That was, he had been home from the hospital for about a month. We both were kind of in this place of just feeling so lost and so unwell and just completely falling apart and really not just too exhausted to really care or try. And you just fall into that, that disenfranchised helplessness disenfranchised. Though, that you mentioned. Yeah, you're disenfranchised. So, I mean, I, look, I don't, I, I, <clears throat> I, I feel for you. I mean, I just, you're in a hospital, they're dealing with an infection and the only way they know how is antibiotics and give you insulin. But meanwhile, they're just adding fuel to the fire to kind of, and then, yeah, now you're in pain and they're, you know, people, so they have good intentions, right? They have very good intentions. Let's fix his infection. We'll give him insulin to manage his sugar, right? And they have very good intentions. Let's fix his pain, right? Let's give him pain medication. But they, there's no communication about, you know, the real scope of what's going on here. Hey, these pills, they're going to make you terribly constipated. You're going to need more and more. And you're going to be on this for a really long time. You know, you're going to be on, it's coming off of this is going to be brutal, right? But they don't, you know, they don't have the doctors who did the surgery. They're not the ones following up with you. Your primary care, you probably have hospital doctors. They're not the ones who's going to see you in, in two months or three months, right? And then maybe you have a pain management doctor. They're happy to get their monthly check from seeing you, you know, every month for your medications, keeping you hooked. I mean, yeah, they, everybody has an intention of wanting to get people off, but it's not an easy, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, there definitely, uh, like you said, there's no one person that was in, a, aware of everything that happened with him from start to finish through all of it. And if you are not willing to take that into your own hands, which we weren't at the time, then you're right. You're just talking to all these individual people about what their specialty is and what their intentions are to fix. So, holy crap. I mean, now the stress of all that, uh, two young kids, I mean, Laura, what's that like for you? So, you, I mean, at what point do you're, you know, what point do you start battling these things? You know, I'm sure you, it's taking a toll on your family. I mean, how long ago? I mean, it sounds like you've been battling it your whole life, but, but when did you start winning? Let's put it that way. Um, it was about a year after that, honestly, after Chris came home from the hospital, it was almost a year later before we really felt like we could get our feet under us again. I kind of had a wake up call. I, had um, a work conference that I go to every year that I have to fly to and they require you to wear like specific shirts for this conference and I had to order I was planning for that conference a couple months out and I realized none of my shirts fit and that none of the women's shirts fit like I couldn't even order the women's 2xl shirts and that was the biggest size they offered so I had to order the men's uh, 2XL shirts to get something to fit me for that conference. And I went like, well, this is embarrassing. <laughs> like, that's a problem. Our son was about ready to turn two. And I weighed more than I did with him than when I went into labor with him, which was another huge wake up call. Um, and we just, I just decided mm. like, I mean, we were always very good at starting diets. And so I, we, again, we started the diet. We had started one January 1st of, this was 2018. We started on January 1st, but it was already March and we had fallen off two or three times, I'm sure. So it wasn't that we never stopped starting, but I kind of um, had a couple big things coming out between March and May. Our son turned two in April. I had this conference in May. So I got some goals and some motivation that I needed. So I started in March of um, 2018. And had those new, I wasn't like, I knew in my head, I wasn't going to cheat for those two months because I had something to prepare for. But then after that, who, I, who knew, like, I didn't know that this was the time that I would quit giving up, right? Things evolved. You, you decide every time everybody's good at starting a diet. It's then what happens after that. And so I finally, this time for the thousandth time I had started a diet in my life, 
figured out as I was going, like how to stop failing at it. At the same time, I had actually done research about what happened on my arm, yeah. why it happened, because no doctor gave me that stuff. So I did that on my own. And I had went to my primary care doctor and he said my A1C was too high. It was 11.6. Holy oh, shit. I was on metformin. And he said he needed to put me on insulin shots. And I said, no. Let wait, me wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. You get out of your, <clears throat> get out of, you're battling this infection. You make it out, several surgeries. Okay. How long after you get out is your A1C 11.6? About a year. So a year goes by. They're giving you pain pills. They're giving you a bunch of other stuff. Someone decides to follow up with you, check your A1C, and it's 11.6. Just so you guys know, this is like a severe, that means his average sugar is probably around 250, 300. That's like a fertile ground for another infection. And, There's and a really, huge percentage of people that once they have this infection, they get it again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's okay. Mm -hmm. So your primary care docs with you says you need to go on insulin. How long was that conversation? How long was that meeting? 10 minutes or less. <laughs> okay. And, but, but you're resistant. So, right. But what, I what, said, how did, yeah. yeah. I said, uh, I don't want to do that. Let me, I had already known because I had done a little research that the situation could be remedied, you know, through diet and lifestyle and things. So I'd already done a little bit of research on that. So I said, Give me three months. I'll make an appointment. And if my numbers are still bad, you can put me okay, on. So you're, so you're bargaining now. You're, you're bargaining. You're basically like, you know, you don't want to face the needle. You don't want to face the injection. You, 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 now you're like, I'm going to do this on my own. And you're bartering with them. And what is he? I'm just curious. What do they say? Your primary care. He actually said, okay, but, but you can't sustain like this, you know, See what yeah. you can do. He, he he said okay, and then uh, scheduled me for three months. He was on um, blood pressure medication at the time, uh, cholesterol medication. Um, me obviously, maxed out on metformin, nerve medication for his arm. Like I don't even remember what else. Like all, a huge but list of medications. You know what? I mean, did anybody even think maybe all that pain is from nerve damage from that high sugar? Did anybody even tell you like, hey, wait a second? You know, all your nerves are getting killed. Well, it was only in my arm that I had the nerve pain. So, um, yeah. nobody that, ever... that when that sugar is a when your A one C is eleven point six, no nerve is healing. Right. Not one nerve is healing. Right. I mean, you're that that is the sugar is an attack on the nerves. It literally attacks the small blood vessels that feed the nerves. And in fact, if you look at diabetics, this is an interesting fact that I didn't realize. Well, we kind of know this from the from the MS and spinal cord injury data, but diabetics with peripheral neuropathy, so which is a fancy way of saying, you know, nerve pain out in the, in, you know, your arms and legs, um, they do better, guess what, with a higher or lower LDL? What do you think? Higher. Higher LDL means the nerves heal better, right? A higher LDL, little known fact, right? But we put every diabetic patient on a statin which lowers an LDL, which lowers the LDL. And what does a satin do? A satin increases the sugar, right? If you're lowering your LDL, it typically increases the sugar, particularly in women. It can raise the A1C. So um, anyway, did they put you on a statin? I'm just curious. I was on a statin for probably five to 10 years. Got it, okay. So for that. That I was on for a long time. So before before I even was diagnosed type two diabetic, I was on uh, a statin and a blood pressure medication. Your typical yeah typical wow. situation. So I, I'm just imagining there's a big fire under your butt now, right? Both of you guys right. really yeah. You know? At that point, then the research really started, and that's when we found. We, yeah, yeah, we okay. started, so I started in March and then Chris was uh, right behind me and, 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 he, and he started and that made it, we were always good at like doing things together. 
but then one of us would convince the other one to have a cheat day. But this time we started doing more research. We started, you know, I used to tease him about listening to all his podcasts he listens to. And now I do a podcast. Like it's just, you know, he would listen to podcasts. We found YouTube videos. We found um, Dr. Fung's book. We found this podcast. We found um, kind of down the rabbit hole, we found carnivore and really just started with low carb, what we knew when keto was a thing back then, right? This was the height of keto in 2018, which was great. Uh, we were doing the dirty keto like we knew. And then over time, we just kept cutting things out more and more. The more we realized what was keeping us hungry, we cut out the quest bars because we realized that wasn't, that wasn't helping. And we just, that wasn't keeping me full. It wasn't sustaining you. And we went down this path of like evolving with and researching uh, to find what led us to carnivore. So basically you guys went to YouTube and you got a, a medical degree from YouTube and podcasts, right? Yeah. yeah. What a sad world. Mm -hmm. What a sad world. You have a team of doctors, you're hospitalized for months. Okay. You sh both struggled with weight for, for, you know, your whole lives ready to give up and you had to find insight from YouTube and right. from podcasts and from blogs, yep. right? And that's what helped you lose weight. Like it, I'm embarrassed for my profession. Yeah, I'm embarrassed. I mean, I, it's not even it's men, mentionable after him, but I, that was part of my rock bottom too, is I was currently seeing a specialist for gallstones. I was having uh, gallstones and I also was seeing somebody like a colorectal specialist about digestive issues. And I'm in my thirties, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm in my 30s and I'm talking about having like some major intestinal surgery um, for some issues that I'm having. And so like all of those specialists, every single time, all of, I'm pre-diabetic at the time, my doctor, I'll just, no, I look back at my numbers now and I see that I'm pre-diabetic. Nobody said a word to me about being pre-diabetic when I look back at my A1C. I didn't have one doctor say anything to me and everything. I'm, there, I'm sitting there, I'm almost 300 pounds. Nobody said anything to me uh, about all of this and we just from all of the dozens of doctors that we both were seeing. I don't know whether to like, I don't, I'm like filled with deep sorrow, sadness, right? And anger. Like that's, these are the feelings I get when I hear what's happening, right? I, I'm angry, you know, even at myself, like it's not just, you know, I'm not like, it's not an outwards anger. You know, if you came to me eight years ago, right? I would have been that arrogant doctor who spent 10 minutes with you and said, you got nothing to do, but take metformin, go see a nutritionist, have a nice day. Right. And that's the way we were trained. And, um, uh, I understand the paradigm. I know these are not malicious people, but we are failing. We failed you. We failed both of you guys. And you had to turn to YouTube and podcasts. I mean, what an utter failure our profession is they have to nearly cut off your arm right i mean what an utter so i don't know whether to tear and be sad and cry or whether to be angry but i mean this is like this is um this is terrible yeah i mean well on the other hand it's magnificent right yeah, i'm it's grateful magnificent. Yeah, yeah. I, on the other hand it's magnificent i mean like you got say like you went to youtube you found all these people Jason Fung, probably Sean Baker, Paul Saladino, Noakes, Fedke, Sarah Hallberg, you know, all these people who put out things, you know, Verda's that's just done amazing things, this podcast, um, you know, um, yeah, so, so, you know, how did you, you know, what, what brought you further into the rabbit hole and who are the people who really affected you, you know, from YouTube MD? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think everybody at the very beginning, everybody finds Dr. Berg. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dr. Berg. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, can be debatable on people's perspective on that, but, uh, which is hilarious now, but that's where you evolve to, right? That's the first person that you click on. And then yeah, you realize YouTube then you marketing go, is the thing, you know, YouTube you grow past it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't go look for him. If you're listening to the, he's a, intro. It's a great intro, but now we're here. Yeah. Yes, then, uh, Jason Fung was where really, uh, hit with me with the diabetes and everything because of his work with that and the fasting and everything. And so 
even before switching to carnivore, we started doing intermittent fasting and, and some longer fasts and things like that. And, you know, he really breaks down a lot about the hunger and the, why you eat and all those different things you've been discussing. So le learning that and then. Uh, that was big, especially for him. And then my mom was, I mean, I mentioned her earlier, but she's always been overweight. She also was type two diabetic. She was taking uh, Victoza shots and like all kinds of like injections for her. She's in her sixties, you know, and she heard that we were fasting and just thought we had this eating disorder and thought we were being restrictive. And so giving her things like Dr. Fung's books on uh, obesity code and um, diabetic code, like all those things, really all, giving her Dr. Barry videos, like those things, she finally clicked for her that there were these doctors that were explaining things to her and that we weren't doing a 36 hour fast and having an eating disorder. But that's when things clicked for her, for us, as far as like using these tools to reverse our metabolic conditions more than just lose weight. Cause we've always been able to lose weight, but now we were looking at reversing metabolic conditions uh, through a lot of these tools. So, so like Dr. Fong and, and then I went down, you know, Ben Bickman and, and into the science of what's happening in the, in the organs and all this and really understanding that really empowers you, and, you know, as far as what I was eating and then it was like the Dr. Baker and, and the carnivore thing made it so simple for me because I've always hated vegetables. So that really made it simple for me and I was not hungry and I could eat a mess. I could eat till I hurt and then just not eat for 24, 36 hours and be completely fine and just watch the progress happen. And her mom would see the progress, you know, over the course of a month, right. two months, like, wow, like what's happening? And then she was on board. I mean, him getting away. off of medications, then all of a sudden she started believing it too, yeah. because, and I mean, you can never, people want to know, like, how do I convince my mom or your, what, you can't, my mom was never going to believe me. She believes him way more than she believes me because he had the diabetes and he, you know, he was able to get off of that medication. Um, but I think this podcast was huge. We listened to like Ted Naiman quite a bit as well, understanding how you can adjust your protein and energy. Um, we, you know, we've always done carnivore, which is considered to be high fat, but you also have to be able to kind of pull those different levers. And that's really how we live our lives now. And the simplest way to say, like, how did you fix all your issues and lose all this weight is you got to find the levers that you're focusing on your hunger level lever and your fasting and adjust some protein and fat and like kind of play around with those things till you find where you're satisfied and where you're happy and where you're content and keep it simple. You know, us cutting out so much of that processed food all of a sudden is what made us stop being hungry. Uh, and then eating the food, like eating the meat. That's when I was bought in was when I, you're right. You said earlier, you can eat a huge salad and still be hungry. Well, I just quit eating salads and just started eating steak. And it made such a difference. Yeah, so so walk me through that because I think um, I'd like to understand that uh, we have some people that go very strict carnivore as like an autoimmune type of, uh, you know, a, a, an approach. They're doing like an elimination diet, so to speak. And there's other people who are just like, I don't like vegetables too much. And, you know, like when they go out to eat, if there is, happens to be some broccoli, they'll eat it but they just won't make it, right? And then there's other people who, you know, are carnivore-ish who, you know, just basically have meat and, and you know, if, if mom's over, they'll make a salad and otherwise, you know, otherwise they don't. So where do you guys stand on, on that spectrum, you know? Uh, For me, it was always, uh, I, I hated vegetables. I don't know if it's because my parents tried to make meat when I was a kid, so I just had a thing for them. They just taste gross to me. And so I've always forced myself to eat them. And then when we first started doing dirty keto, you know, we would make vegetables and I would eat one or two bites so that she would stay off my back. And then once I found the carnivores, I was like, I'm done with that. And I never went back and I'd be happy for the rest of my life, never eating something green and, you know, that <laughs> green stuff was never yeah. my problem or my desire. It's the the white stuff, the carbs, the bread, the, that stuff was always the problem. So for me, it was awkward at first because most of the time, like if I go to a restaurant with a coworker and it's, you know, happens to be a, a male and they order a salad and I'm ordering like 
three a la carte burger patties with cheese and bacon. Like they always mix up the plates at the table. Like they always think that I'm supposed to eat the salad. Like I should be yeah. eating salad. And so to make that switch, I, 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 it took me longer to find carnivore for that reason, because I thought I should be eating the salad and a little bit of meat on the side. Um, and I, you know, it wasn't until I actually tried carnivore and then I tried to add the salad back into it that I realized how much bloating I felt with it, how many digestive issues. I had struggled with constipation and pretty extreme, you know, intestinal issues for a lot of years. And that was completely fixed. And I have no issues whatsoever when I'm being carnivore. So I would, I mean, I like salad. I would have a big something salad, but I want the croutons and the, all the stuff on it that you're not supposed to have. Uh, or that's the carby stuff on top of it. But I just felt better without vegetables. I didn't realize that all of my digestive issues went away when I cut out the broccoli um, and cut out those things. If like I made a chicken salad the other day and I put some pickles in it that I was fine with that. But I, we pretty much stay away from vegetables because of they just give me gas, <laughs> like give me digestive issues. Uh, don't make me feel good. I would love to eat nuts but they're so addicting, I can't stop. And I break out, it causes me to have inflammation. Um, I get crazy acne breakouts anytime I overeat nuts, which is the only way I know how to eat nuts. Um, and I think that's it. Like a lot of it is we found that the more strict we are, the more satisfied we are. I find freedom and restriction. The more that I stick to carnivore, the less that I'm tempted by other things. There are times just on a makes holiday- It just makes it easy. You come home. You throw some ribeye on the on the grill. You eat till you're full, you know, and uh, you just won't deviate too much. But if you're out at a wedding or something like that, would you guys, you know, taste the asparagus or not really? I mean, he wouldn't should. like it. I'm I I don't think I would just because you feel better without it. Yeah, I feel. I mean, there's yeah. to me, there's no reason. Like then maybe I'll just decide I want to eat it all the time again, and I know that. I physically wouldn't feel good doing that. Chris wouldn't have ever eaten it in the first place, but right. um, we both are not, neither one of us are like looking at envious over the asparagus. We're both like yeah. drooling over the cake and we know that that's not where we can go. And so Got it. what about, um, yeah, speaking of cakes, what about like, you know, you mentioned ice cream. Now you mentioned cakes, like, you know, uh, uh, I, I'm a big believer initially in replacing those, those types of foods for people who are, who are uninitiated, you know, yeah. uh, with low carb versions. Do you guys, you know, what do you do for your kids' birthdays? What do you do for, you know, how do you handle those moments? You know, I'm, I'm sure that's a little bit of a challenge, right? Or, I think for, for yeah. us particularly, like we, we did those replacements for us at first. And I think anybody just starting out, do what you have to do, right? You know, um, but eventually we realized that those things still triggered us. And if you eat too much of those things, they're still just as bad. So once we were free of those things, you know, like she said, it was a weight lifted, you know, it's uh, liberating to be free of that. So we don't do that anymore. A couple of times in the last couple of years, like on a holiday, we've had like a Lily's bar or something. And we find ourselves in a spiral for a few days trying to stop thinking about them. So we realized, you know, that's not a good idea. But for the kids, you know, so um, let's let's it, just talk about that real quick because yeah. so people just to understand right so you know you can be low carb it doesn't mean there's no it can still trigger that dopamine release I mean oh, opening okay. up the bar right unraveling the foil you know taking a bite out of it all this is like a uh, could be part of that addiction cycle I had low carb cereal I don't know it was like two years ago or a year ago where I opened the box and I opened the bag up, you know, <laughs> and I poured the cereal and it hit the sound hitting the bowl and then putting the milk on it. I felt like I would might as well wrap like a tourniquet around my, you know, arm and be doing that. But, you know, what I found when I afterwards was, um, was interesting because when I had regular cereal, I wouldn't stop eating, right? Like the box would be done and I'd be like, but like after the low carb cereal, I just found myself nauseous. You know what I mean? Maybe it was the sweetener, maybe it was the protein. I don't know really what, but um, definitely had a little bit of a different effect. But I know exactly what you're saying. Once you go back to that sweet taste or that savory taste and your body, your brain, obviously we're, we're drawn to that, right? We're, we're animals at the end of the day with basic instincts, right? That sweet and variety and that savory taste will get your brain wanting more. 
yeah. you know, and uh, and it's tough. And you and we don't want that because we're in an environment of constant food. You don't want to be hungry, right? And you do not want to be hungry in our modern world, right? Right? Because the result is exactly what happened to you guys. Um, so you guys found a lot of freedom just keeping it very simple, plain, you know, delicious but fulfilling. And that's where, and so how long have you guys been carnivore? Um, I'll be, I just passed three years a couple days ago. Yeah. Wow. Well, we're, we're coming up on three. Maybe Not the sustainable, first, right? <laughs> the first six months of that probably was us like weaning down off of some other things, but it's definitely been three years since we've been doing this journey. You know, we both struggled quite, I mean, listen, that does not mean like I thought it was going to be, I lost the weight, I hit my goal. Now things are perfect and mentally easy forever. And it wasn't, you know, 2020 was a big setback and wake up call for us. I think like a lot of people, this unfortunate situation of just like everybody's home and your pantries are stuffed and you have nowhere to go. And there's just, it's really unfortunate the way that that happened. And because of, I meant I'm such a goal person and I'm such a look forward to this date and I'm such a determined person to work towards something well when they take away everything that you can work towards and look to and go and like you're stuck in your house like we both gained a lot of weight last year and i think what's a lot of weight I'm not a lot i mean <laughs> for me what's like a lot of weight for me like 15 15 pounds or so so you went from you went from like 200 to 215 no no i was went from about 180 to 205 <laughs> All right, just I'm laughing because that's like nothing. Okay, right. all right. So I mean, I gained more okay. than that. I think I I definitely but, I had gotten all the way down from like 270. I'd gotten all the way down to like 140 pounds, um, wow. which honestly I'm not gonna lie is probably was too thin. And I got a little like determined to lose weight. I also got a little obsessed with like excess skin, which I have, and I thought like, well, if I just keep losing weight and and exercising at the time. Um, we didn't talk about exercise when either one of us exercised pretty much the entire time until we got to our goal weights and we wanted to tone up. And so, you know, I got a little obsessed with trying to like lose that skin and thought if I just keep losing, it'll go away. And it didn't. And so I got a little too thin. And so that all or nothing mindset of, well, I need to gain some weight, even though I was staying carnivore or keto based in 2020, I still had this mindset of like, well, you need to like, gain a little weight. I don't know what that means. And so I gained 40 pounds last year. And so for the first time, I've, I've lost 20 of that now, but I finally feel like for the first time in a year, I just have my feet back solidly underneath of me of like in a good place. I'm still trying to figure out like what's my... So navigating the mental landscape has been yes. a challenge now and maintaining weight. So can you walk me through? So still it's astronomical weight loss. It's understandable. In that stressful environment, you're going to find yourself eating more. But it sounds like you kept carnivore. So I'm interested in this and I want to go into it a little bit because, you know, I want to understand the self-talk there, you know, because that's got to be scary as hell to yeah. put on 35 pounds for somebody who, who had lost weight, battled weight their whole life, found something that's working. One, you know, what was going on in your mind? And two, you know, what is it that, you know, you, you ate carnivore. So how did you gain weight with carnivore? That's what I want to know, because I know the answer, but I want to hear, I want to hear it from, from you. I mean, the answer is it's very easy. I just didn't stop eating. I mean, there's that element too. We were, I was, I'm used to traveling. I have a corporate job and I'm gone all the time and I travel quite a bit and I'm not used to being home and in my house and access to food. I wake up, grab three cheese slices, go hit the desk and start working. Take a little break, grab some handful of pepperonis, come back to my desk, keep working, get up, go eat some bacon, go back to work. And I stopped the fasting, which has been a huge element for us. I allowed myself to not eat clean. I wasn't eating I still, then I ate, then I ate my big old steak at lunchtime. And then at night we had the pork rinds and the bust, bust out the salami and bust out the string cheese. I mean, I was eating a, I could eat a pack of string cheese in a day. I can't even eat them anymore. That's not something I allow myself because they're, they're, I can't stop. You know, we got, we, all of our food addiction habits came back with the nonstop eating, the mindless hunger, the grazing, the watching TV and mindlessly eat an entire bag of pork rinds. I think that was the first time was our wake up in the, 
at first it was fun. I mean, we're, you're not going to go anywhere. Nobody's letting you go anywhere, which is a whole other conversation, but might as well just eat. I don't have anything where to be. Let's sit on the couch tonight. So and eat. You're, you're stressed out animals seeking out comfort. Yes. And now instead of it being, you know, super hyper palatable food that literally makes you hungry two hours later, it's higher fat food that's salted and flavored cheese, salami, um, and you're eating more frequently. So yeah. do you guys have pets? I'm just curious. No. We have pets? Oh, a snake. <laughs> you have a snake. Hey, once okay. a, we got a fasting snake at a carnivore. We got a fasting Yeah, a fasting pet. carnivore snake. So have you guys either either of you had a dog or or you know were growing up or anything like that? Yeah. yeah. And you put food in front of that dog, what happens? They eat it every time. They eat it, right? And three hours later you put more food in front of a dog, what happens? They eat it. They eat it. Now you stress out the animal, give it a uh, comfort deficiency. And you put food in front of that animal every three hours, what happens? They eat it, I assume, They right? eat it, right? Yeah. They eat it, right? So at the end of the day, you know, um, so you found you found the way to gain weight on carnivore, and that's to go super high fat and palatable, eat more frequently, right? So, okay. And so you notice it, you're probably not happy about it. I, If I were in that position, and I gained weight a little bit uh, after my surgery, couldn't exercise anymore, pandemic, right? Um, and uh, it was a mind, like it was a mental, yeah. screw, excuse my language, it was a, it was a mess, yeah. right? Because, you know, now it's like, oh my God, you know, we're gaining weight. And so how did you battle back? How did you claw back? I mean, we had to, we try again, we tried and we tried. We're not okay. We're not going to snack anymore. We're not going to do cheese anymore. We're not going to like, we kind of got on board and then somebody's like watching TV and they're like, there is a bag of pork rinds in there. Like, oh, well, it's also cheese. Like we kind of, we tried and tried and tried again. We're definitely those types of, of people. Um, and we really, I mean, uh, to be honest, social media helps keep me accountable. I share my life every day and you're gaining weight and I'm not looking so good. And that is very embarrassing to me. And it's pretty mortifying to have to put yourself out there and, and be called out like that uh, on, on YouTube and the comment section was, you know, that is what it is as far as like, well, she looks like she got fat again. <laughs> my face doesn't lie. It definitely swells up quite a bit. Um, and, and deflates when I'm eating something that's causing me inflammation, which is, you know, too much, um, too much cheese and, and things like that. So that helped. Um, but more than anything, finding goals. We finally just said like, great, let's plan a trip. Let's go somewhere. Let's plan an event. Let's do host a meetup locally. Let's do something. I had to give myself those benchmarks again. I had to give myself something to look forward to that mentally helped push me. I had to make it through one day at a time and make it through the weekend and make it through the week and then pick those goals. And now I have, you know, I'm flying to Austin and we're going to do a big carnivore meetup in Austin in a, in a month or so. And then I have, we kind of just started planning things that would help keep us focused and knowing what we need to stay on track um, are those benchmarks and had to kind of find those again, almost like we're starting over again, which is why it's so easy to fall back into that helplessness that you mentioned. It's like, we didn't gain all of our weight back, not even close, but you feel like that. You gain a little and you mentally, you feel like you're starting all over again. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I know it's a, it's a tough place, you know, to face adversity when it comes to weight, especially if you've got a lifetime of struggle. So good, good for you guys for keeping it. And then you've noticed that the power of community, the power of support, you know, that these are really, really powerful things uh, to keep us going. Um, and you, to some extent, you mentioned sublimating. Basically, this is your lifestyle now. You're going to mm -hmm. kind of revolve a little bit. You're, you're making community. Some people, you know, I, we bash Weight Watchers here uh, all the time. But one thing that they do very well is create a community, right? You get them together, you meet, you clap, right? One thing the vegans do very well is they give people this sense of moral superiority and community that they're that they're doing that they're doing something better than themselves like there's something that you know it's not just their weight it's something else so they're tapping into that uh other part of it you know the the conscience and they're tapping into community and they're tapping tapping into support you know i've talked to brian for a long time you know we want to make like a low carb church so to speak where 
we give people community, we give people, you know, like, hey, look, this is your health. And you know, I think what the important thing here is, and one of the real lessons that I think people can take away is, you know, you can gain, you, if, you're, if you do not respect appetite and hunger, right, right, and you do not respect, you know, your, abil- your brain's ability to get food, you know, you can fail with any paradigm, right? Mm-hmm. It's just harder to fail with carnivore, right? But look at what you did. You, you gravitated to cheese, you gravitated to, you know, uh, snackable kind of meats that are really savory and salty, right? Uh, any animal would have done that, right? It would have been a no brainer. If your dog did that, you wouldn't say anything. You know, you'd be like, of course, of course he's doing that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just, it, you know, it's interesting. There's a way to fail in, at any diet and how important it is, wow, to get that adversity. But then I think the real story here is the mental game is just um, like on point. I mean, you guys have a vision of success. You're going to succeed. You're not going to fail. You know, you're going to examine adversity. And I mean, look at what you guys did. You're, you're, you, you, were, you were faced a little bit of struggle, both of you, and now you've crawled, you know, you're crawling back. Um, we learned a lot, that's for sure, last yeah, year. a lot of mental stamina. Um, and, that, and I think that's the, um, you know, that's critical for anything, right? For any part of he- overall health is that mental, that resiliency. We call it tenacity here. Uh, we have, you know, our uh, six defenses for maintaining a lifestyle. One of these, the first one of which is awareness. I mean, you guys woke up, you had to go to YouTube MD, you had to go to, you know, podcast MD, get the insight, you, you examined what caused you to fail. Preparation, I mean, that's not hard for you guys, you know, just prepare. If you're, you know, coming home and you have to stare at your kids' Cheez-Its versus, you know, having two ribeyes on the grill, you know, ready to go. I mean, it's an easy decision when you got two ribeyes on the grill, Right. So preparation is key. Self-advocacy, I think that's what you're cultivating now. Like, hey, this is for our health. This is for our life. This is for our future. And, and you know, I don't want to disappoint all the people that follow me on social media and YouTube and whatnot. Uh, but stay off the chat for your mental health. Oh I know. <laughs> <laughs> stay yeah. off the chat. And then uh, the other thing is, you know, community and support. How valuable it is to have each other right? How valuable it is to have like a greater community, you know? Um, And then, you know, certainly at some point you need some impulse control. Like if you're staring at that pork rinds, you know, and you just put the kids to sleep and now you're relaxing with Netflix, like don't expect that you're not going to want it. Of course you're going to want it, right? And then the last one, which you guys really exemplified here, our last defense is, you know, tenacity, you know, which is like the ability to say, hey, something's wrong here. What's what, you know, not go to all, you know what, I gained 40 pounds. I might as well go back to the Quest bars and, you know, and birthday cake and whatever it was, right? You didn't do that. You're like, okay, you know what, let me just slow down, figure this out. I mean, you guys, I think will be healthy for your lifetime. You know, what? what's your big tip? If you had like, one or two big tips to give people that are just listening, inspired by you guys. Um, what, what would be your, you know, one or two tips? I think the biggest one for me is just don't wait till Monday. Like I'm the queen of starting a diet on a Monday and then by Tuesday or Wednesday I fall off and then I, well, I might as well wait till next Monday. Whatever you're, whatever you're listening to right now, if this, if you're listening to this on a Thursday afternoon, like this is the time, like there's, it's having that food one more time is not going to make a difference for you. Um, is my biggest tip is just to say, start now, keep trying. If you mess up, start again. Like it's just, it, it's to not give up. Like you said, the tenacity element. I think, uh, something you mentioned earlier was like, uh, learning about the mechanisms of why you, why you feel the way you feel, what drives the issue within you. You know, myself, I think of, the carbs is a drug, which in some sense they are, and I'm an addict, and it's almost like a 12-step program, mini 12-step program, and I know I'm always going to be an addict, and I know that I can't do that, and here's my toolbox that I've learned from all you experts, you know, of what I can do to manage that, and what I need to do 
and, and, and pull those levers, use each tool that's most effective for you and that, that you can sustain, it's sustainable for you. Um, some people that's fasting, some people it's protein to energy ratio, some people it's, uh, you know, or keto or carnivore or low carb or, or vegetarian, whatever your, your thing is, you know? uh, uh, what you can do and sustain and understanding, you know, the danger of what happens if you go back. You know, it's, it's funny that you say levers, uh, because, you know, in our practice, I'm going to bring it up here for people who are alive, but in our practice, do you guys see this? We have basically seven levers to weight loss and you guys oh, wow. hit all of them, you know, <laughs> basically the first and foremost, reduce carbs. You did that. How critical was it for you guys to, you know, stop the snacking and reduce your meal frequency? Yes. Right. Reducing the added fats. Remember you're eating that cheese and the pepperoni, right? I mean, you had to, you know, you found a way once you did these two, which was reduce your carbs, you still found a way to add fat, right? You found the way that your brain found the way and we shouldn't expect anything from our brains, right? So you had to reduce that added fat. I'm guessing you guys then added exercise, right? To maintain, help maintain the weight. And then, you know, there's some other things to focus on if you really need help after that. But those have been big for us. The extended fasting, we both do that, uh, you know, usually quarterly and fit that in and focusing on sleep. Those are big for us too. Yeah, mental health. I mean, you got the mental health game down. Like, I'm not going to quit, right? I'm going to give myself goals. I'm going to reduce my stress. I'm going to get good sleep so that I can uh, I can go on and and uh, win. Um, because I don't. You take anybody. You sleep deprive them. Give them stress. Give them two kids. Give them a mom who's sick. You know, give them a pandemic and what and put them in a house with Netflix and chicarones. What do you think is going to happen? You know. Yeah, you're going to gain weight. So uh, you guys really, uh, this is an amazing story. And thank you. Thank you so much for sharing it. Um, I know you're going to inspire a lot of people. And I think I cannot imagine a world where, especially together, you know, that you guys don't succeed and maintain a healthy, happy life. Um, how do people, if people want to find you, track you down, uh, how would they find you? The best place to start probably would just be YouTube if you look up Laura Spath on YouTube and then uh, Instagram is where we kind of show daily life. I usually post what I eat that day or, you know, in stories kind of us and the kids hanging out. Um, but YouTube, I have a lot more videos that dive into like what we eat, what does fasting look like for us and a little more nuance about um, our journey. So you know what, we got one question here. And if anybody has a question, any of the Patreon, any of the live people have a question, you can flow it in. We got one question here, if you don't mind answering it. Sure. Um, so I'm going to read it to you. And, and uh, you know what, let me even see if I can bring it on the screen. Uh, no, I can't. Okay, so it's basically the question is, so much of what you say, this comes from Greg, so much of what you say tracks with my experience and the ups and the downs of trying to figure this out. It's so great to hear these experiences from someone else. Thank you so much for telling your story. I uh, now consider myself marginally less of an idiot for long-term failing. Would you mind expanding on how you keep your short-term uh, goals different and interesting? That also is something that works for him. So, you know, you mentioned this goal setting type behavior that you, that you have. How does that work for you? And, you know, what does that, what does that look like? I think uh, holidays are a big trigger for me, to be honest, because of the specialty foods that are out there. Like I was a big person who like bought up all of the specialty holiday foods, the Easter foods and the Christmas foods and like, you know, stuffed our pantry with it. And like, we ate on it for months afterwards. And like, I, it's, that's still hard for me when you go to the grocery store and you see that thing that, you know, was only there at Easter or, you know, was only there at, Christmas. And so I still have to tell myself, like, just not this year, like, it will be there. It's always there. Every time you go down, it's always there. And so sometimes it's just getting past those things of me telling myself not now, even though I know, like, okay, future me can talk myself out of it again. But like, right now, if I told myself that food sitting on the shelf there, you're never going to have that again, ever is sometimes is a little daunting for me. And it just makes me want to say, forget it. So I have to kind of just get through the moment, get through that holiday, get through that weekend. And really too, just, I wish I could say that 
being healthy forever is enough of a goal for me. And I'm, unfortunately it's not. So it's putting myself of like, I need, you know, I want to, um, I want to be healthy for this reason and picking a reason that's a little bit in the future. Like my birthday's coming up this month. So that's a reason we have a vacation planned after that. That's my reason we have a, you know, I want to do this on this day, which is a reason, I guess I try to put those things in my head that I can, I can work towards that help me stay on track uh, and think, and think forward to of that. I think too, that kind of relates to accountability, uh, situations that will self-impose accountability. So, I know I'm going to go to this public event and people know that uh, I've been working on myself this way. I will automatically have uh, a motive to not fail that. So, or swimsuit season is coming or, you know, I want to fit in my, my Christmas suit or whatever, you know, the next thing is, you know, you can set these little goals that way. I think, the, sorry, the biggest thing too is, <clears throat> knowing what's going to trigger us. And that's the mental part that we've learned the most over the last three years is I know I'm going to go to this place and they're going to have pizza and cake and everybody else is going to be eating those things. That's going to be tempting for me. What can I do to avoid that? I eat a big steak before I go. I bring my own snack if necessary. Well, especially in the beginning, you bring your own food or like, I think it's looking ahead and planning, where am I going to be triggered? That would be a goal setting for me is like saying, this is going to be event an event that's going to be difficult for me or a, a time. How can I plan ahead to avoid that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's just uh, expecting adversity, right? Yes. You know, and kind of getting set up and then, you know, creating an environment where you're uh, an external environment that supports your long-term goals. Yeah. I mean, these are high level kind of planning things that definitely help, right? And if you're, in, I mean, we know that obesity spreads in social networks. So look at it, you guys gained and lost weight together, right? Even in the pandemic, even carnivore, you guys gained weight together and then you lost weight together, right? So our social networks definitely influence kind of, you know, if everybody's eating birthday cake on birthdays 10 times a year, what do you think you're going to be doing? Yeah. Right. What do you think you're going to be doing? So this idea of creating an environment that supports your goals, I think it's really critical. Listen, both of you, thank you so much. That's all the questions we have right now, but thank you so much for joining us. Oh, wait, actually, I take it back. We got one more question. Cool. All right. So if you have more time, um, uh, no, it's actually just a comment. Shelly's saying, I want to thank you for telling your story. It helps others know that they aren't alone and it can be done being real, talking about the ups and downs are important. And just so you know, I saw the picture of you that you posted online with the excess skin, you know, and I, I mean, everybody asks me every day, like, do you have excess skin? Yes, I have excess skin. You know, just what happens over time, you deal with it, right? That's it. You know, over time, you deal with it. Um, my wife's happy just the way I am. So that's, that's the way I kind of view it yeah all right guys thank you so much thank you for joining me um and patreon supporters thank you so much for supporting this podcast thank you thank you so much thank you